Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Grandparents Day. Thank you. Thank you. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. It's where God's word will be spoken today. Again, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. pray once more as we come to the Lord and His Word. Father, we praise You, we thank You for the privilege and honor of worshiping You and hearing Your Word and being visited by Your presence, Holy Spirit. And God, we thank You for Your goodness in our lives. And that's reflected through our grandparents and the grandparents represented. And we can see your faithfulness through them and you use them to bless us. And God, we ask as we study your word this morning that you would open our minds, our hearts to your truth, that you would humble us so that we can learn and be taught and be molded by your Holy Spirit. And Jesus, we thank you again for your great example. Showing a generous life. And God, I thank you for the privilege of speaking for you, giving courage and boldness, not my words, but your words through me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Welcome to First Belgium Baptist Church. I'm Pastor James. If you are a visitor, welcome. I'm the new senior pastor here. FBC's mission is really about changing lives and making disciples. And that's what we're about here at FBC. If you're here this morning, I'm so thankful that you're here. If you're a visitor, um, we'd love to get to know you and um, just share more about our church and uh, what we're about here in Houston. This morning, the title of the sermon is Generous Life. And really, when we began the series, Light into Darkness, and we're continuing our, our sermon series here at First Building Baptist Church, it's, it's really interesting that we skipped several uh, passages because of, obviously, Harvey. And we got to this point, and I picked it up in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 through 9. And again, this is God at work. God is not a God of coincidence. He doesn't work that way. He's a God who's in control and has a plan. And His word never uh, returns void. And... And it's, it's pretty amazing as I studied 2 Corinthians chapter 8 through 9 how it really is almost a, uh, a continuation of last week's message. And again, last week's message was something that God put in my heart that, I, that, I, that really spoke to how we ought to respond to Hurricane Harvey in the aftermath. And so this morning, we're going to be speaking about generous life. The children are dressed and ready for school. But there is no food for them to eat, said the house mother of the orphanage of George Mueller. George Mueller is a, a, a great man of God, and really, George responded to the, uh, to the house mother and said, take the 300 kids to the dining room and have them sit at the tables. And as his usual routine, George Mueller thanked God for the food, and waited. George knew that God would provide food for their children, and because he always did. And within minutes, a knock was heard, and George Miller opened it, and here's what happened. A man came and said, last night, I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that I had to bring you bread, and so this morning I got up and, break, and baked three batches for you. And another knock was heard, and a milkman came because his cart was broken down, and he had several of milk barges that was going to spoil if you know by by just sitting there. And so 
He donated it to George Mueller and the kids. And so God brought just enough food, bread and milk, for the 300 kids. And they all were able to eat. You see, George Mueller, before he knew Christ, was not always a person of faith or a man who was generous. As a young boy growing up in Germany, he often stole money from his dad. And even when he was in Bible school, he would love going to, to bars to drink and to gamble. And, and, and he loved being the life of the party. And until one moment, a friend of his invited him to a Bible study outside school. And so his intention was to, to attend and to make fun of Christians, because that's what he loved to do. But to his surprise, he actually enjoyed the Bible study. And for the first time, he saw people who really knew and loved God. And so he attended and continued to attend until one evening he had a personal encounter with God as he realized who Jesus is and what the gospel is about. And gave his life to Christ and repented of his sins. At that moment, George Miller's life changed. He saw, his friends saw a difference in his life. He didn't go to bars anymore. He didn't make fun of Christians. He didn't steal money. And what he did was he spent more time reading the word of God. He spent time going to church. And, and really, soon, his friends didn't want to be around him anymore. And even in that moment, George's father did not approve of his new plan, which was to be a missionary. George's father told him, there's no money in becoming a missionary. You're going to be poor. And so his dad said, if you continue on this plan of yours, I will not support you anymore in school. George knew what he had to do, even though it was difficult. He knew that God was calling him to do something great for him. And so as George went back to college, to his, and without knowing how he was going to pay for his tuition, he thought of something that was pretty silly for a grown man to do. He got on his knees, church, and asked God to provide. To his surprise, an hour later, his professor knocked on his door and offered George a paid tutoring job, which allowed him to pay for his school. This was the beginning of George Mueller's dependence on God. And it began with something silly like praying. You see, George Mueller became a missionary and a church pastor in England. And out of there, and as he began his new job as a pastor, he saw something, something that he did not agree in his church. All the rich folks were coming in, dressed nice, they would sit in the front, and all the poor people would sit in the back, and then some of them weren't able to have seats. And so he said something to his congregation, he says, you know, I actually don't want to get paid. Even though they wanted to pay him a good salary, he said, I actually don't want to get paid. I want to be able to, to help the poor people that's coming to our church. And for now on, I actually want everybody to come in. And they can sit wherever they want. You see, George trusted God to meet his own needs. Again, God provided for his family that he didn't, have a, he didn't have a salary, but God provided anyway. Each day as George ministered to his community, as he walked the streets, God began to show him the vision that God has planned. And he saw thousands of kids, families who were poor, didn't have homes, didn't have much to eat. And out of there, he saw that the state-run poor houses were just horrible. And so George knew that God was calling him to start orphanages. And as he prayed for a building, he prayed for people to, to volunteer, he prayed for furniture, he prayed for money to come in. Guess what God did, church? God provided it every time. In his lifetime, his orphanages in England took care of more than 10,000 children. He was actually an instrumental in promoting the idea of faith missions. And faith missions is this, that, that where missionaries are not supported by a denomination, but by individual supporters or churches. See, George Mueller lived out his faith 
in Christ out of gratitude and love. And thus, planting the seeds of generosity to thousands of children and churches. This morning, as we discuss generous life, I want us to think about what it means to be generous. I want us to think about, as followers of Christ, how do we begin to live a life of generosity to people who are in need? In Colossians 3, 23, verse, chapter 3, 23, 24, it says, um, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. This morning, as we celebrate Grandparents' Day and examine what it means to plant the seed of generosity in your life and in our church, the two questions I want to raise is this. The first one is, how does one become generous to others in need? And the second one is, what makes a Christian produce a life of grace giving to his or her neighbor? I believe to answer these two questions, church, we must first find out what drives our lives. Because most people, Christian or not, I believe, are driven by something. Whether that's to be happy and successful for you and your family, maybe it's to achieve a dream or a career, maybe it's to be wealthy, or maybe it's to be a missionary or a church planner. And so most people strive to achieve their dreams and aspirations, but if we look closely to what's driving that force, that driving force allows us to push through challenges to achieve our dreams. And so as we turn to our attention to, to what's happening in our community today, that you can't ignore anymore, that Hurricane Harvey has caused devastations in our state, in our communities, in our cities. What will drive us, FBC, to be generous to thousands of people in need in our community and cities? What will drive us to produce a life of grace giving to our neighbor. As we look at scripture, I believe that driving force, church, that produces generosity and grace giving can only be found in knowing and experiencing the gospel. Knowing and experiencing God's love through His Son, Jesus Christ, and being changed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is that key. Because you could have the driving force of good deeds, of being moral, of being kind, but that can only take you so far. Maybe a week, maybe a month. Because the excitement of volunteerism, of giving, because the whole nation is saying, Houston's strong, right? Pray for Houston. That's, that's a trend. But what happens if that trend disappears and it fades away? If your driving force is not the gospel, then it will fail. But if you have the love of God and experience who He is in your life, and you truly know what that agape love that we talked about last Sunday, that unconditional, selfless, sacrificial love, then when you see your neighbor six months from now, and you see him and her and her children still struggling, still having this sadness of, of being beaten down by Hurricane Harvey and all the things that's piling up, bills and bills and I believe God will still drive you to be generous. And I'm not just saying money. I'm talking about being there for them. Whether that's sharing a meal. Whether that's walking with them and praying with them. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 to 1 through 9. The book of Corinthians is written by Apostle Paul, written around 55 to 57 AD from Macedonia. 
or Ephesus around that time during Paul's third missionary journey. And here he's writing to the city of Corinth. And again, Paul planted this church. And in chapter 8 of our text, Paul begins to turn his attention to the collection of contribution to the poor believers in Jerusalem. At this moment, the Christians in Jerusalem were needing help. They were in need of help. Not just physically, not spiritually, but also they needed food. They, they were poor. And here, Paul, instead of rebuking the church of Corinth to just give, he actually motivates them to be obedient to God's will and to live a life of generosity. I titled point one, motivated by Christ's love and generosity. Let's read eight verses one. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given along the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we have expected, but they have gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he started, as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Verse 8. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you may so that you by his poverty might become rich. Motivated by Christ's love and generosity. In verse 1 of our text, Paul encouraged the church of Corinth to move forward in their renewed commitment by following the examples of the churches of Macedonia. Those are the churches of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. And these churches in Macedonia were faithful in giving. And to the point where Paul is saying, look at the example of the church of Macedonia, church of Corinth. And really, he, again, he did not rebuke them. He called them brothers. He's ready to say this. We want you to know brothers. And this, he addressed to them brothers because he wanted to, to do it in, in a positive way. Because if you think about it, Paul this, at this moment must have been frustrated with the church of Corinth. As we have been going through the second book of Corinthians, he's been rebuking them several times. And at this moment, he would have thought this would have been a no-brainer to give to your brothers in Jerusalem who are in need. And so, but he didn't take it in that path. He took it in a way where he continued to want it, he continued to, to motivate them. And, and as he continues, he says, he, he wanted them to, to take action by the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. And to the point where in verse 2 he says, For in severe tests of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in the wealth of generosity on their part. Because the church of the churches in Macedonia, it's not like they were have, having a great time and it was easy for them to give. No, they were actually going through tribulations and tests. And, and, and out of that, they were still rich in generosity. And so Paul was trying to encourage the church of and say, hey look, the church in Macedonia were going through afflictions and tests and if you guys remember in Acts chapter 17 where Paul and Silas were there 
And, and as they were sharing the gospel, and as, as Paul's regular routine, he would go to the Jewish synagogue and share the gospel completely. And out of that, these men and women began to, to, to create a, a mob who, who wanted to beat them. And at this point, they took Jason and his house out in the streets and were beating them. And they took money from Jason. And so at this time, these churches in Macedonia did not have, a, did not have an easy day or easy, um, you know, didn't have it easy. But Paul said they still gave out their generosity. And so as he compared the church of Corinth, he wanted them to understand that, again, they gave, in verse 3, they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. So they gave what they had, but they went far beyond their means. And what does that look like? It really looks like where, when you give your, it's kind of like when we give our tithes and offering, when we give our 10%. That's just the minimum, actually. And here, the church in Macedonia not only gave their minimum, but they went far beyond and gave abundance more to the, the poor Christians of Jerusalem. And so Paul wanted to motivate the church of Corinth to give generously. And then in verse 5, in verse 4, it says, Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Do you see what happened there? The churches in Macedonia were begging Paul. Say, Paul, let us partake in helping our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Because they knew the privilege and honor to, to give generously. But that wasn't the case in the church of Corinth. They were holding on to their blessings. They were holding on to their generosity. And if you think about it, the church in Corinth, was, they, weren't going, they weren't going through the same afflictions as the church in Macedonia. And then he continues by saying, verse 5, And this, not as to be expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. And I think that's an important thing to understand. And when we live a generous life, and we give, and we are motivated by Christ's love and generosity, we ought to give first to God of ourselves. Because when we have that perspective, and, and, and that's in line, then whatever we do is it really is for His glory. And it's not out of our own selfish ambition or selfless, you know, we want to receive glory, we want to receive accolades, oh, I did this, I did that. No, when we, when the church of Macedonian churches gave first to the Lord, it really showed to Paul that they were legit in being generous. And in verse 6 it says, According, according we urge Titus that as he has started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. And in verse 7 it says, But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace. What is this act of grace that Paul is saying? And I really believe with this act of grace that Paul is encouraging the church of Corinth to do, it's to display the grace that God has showed them. Just, if we are if we want to live a generous life, if we want to give to others in need, but we have never experienced the grace of God, it's going to be difficult for us to give generously. It actually, it will be impossible. But if we experience the grace of God and understand what that means, and if we were at the Sabbath Bible study this past Thursday, and we were talking, we were going through the book of Romans. And, and one of the things that came up in our study was, um, not to put the staff on the spot, but basically that, that we have this tendency to feel self-righteous about ourselves. And, the, and, and, and at that moment, that in our text in Romans, Paul was, was rebuking the Jewish Christians, or the Jews, for being so self-righteous, right? And as we discuss our lesson, we realize it's, we're also in that same 
bold. That we have heard the truth. We have, we have the knowledge of God. And what happens is we become self-righteous about what we know. And when we look at other people, we judge them. But what we learn in that Bible says that we have to remember that we're no better than them. That for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that we need to show the grace of God. Just like if we received it. And so Paul wanted them to excel in grace. But not only in grace, what did he say? He said, excel in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, in our love for you. Because when we live a life of generosity and we are motivated by Christ's love and what he's done for us, it will be seen in how we follow him and our faith in him. It will be seen in, in the way we speak to others and how we are humble towards each other and, and, and forgiving towards each other one another. And not only that, he says, in knowledge and all earnestness in our love for you. Paul's strategy was plain and simple to the church of Corinth. He wanted to affirm to the church God's grace. And he wanted the church of Corinth to excel in this because they were having a hard time giving. Not only that, he wanted them really to be motivated by the example of Christ, His love and generosity. And when they're motivated by that, then they are able to give to the poor Christians in Jerusalem. This week as we, again, contemplate and, and get the sense of what's happening in our state, in our community, in our cities. What is God telling you? How is God moving in your life? Is He asking you to live a generous life? Is He urging you to respond? Again, this is not a coincidence. This is God's movement. I had a call this past, I think a couple days ago, from a good friend of a good pastor friend of mine who married P and I actually, and he's been here before. His name is Pastor Lido Magbanoa. And he said, James, my brothers and sisters in Montana have been praying ever since Harvey hit. And they felt God's movement that they would want to go to Houston. And we have a Native American pastor, two Filipino pastors, and two women who are going to come. And they're looking to work with a Philippine church. And as I prayed about it, and I talked to our elders about it, we, can, we agreed and confirmed that this is God's movement, that He's bringing these people in our city to serve. You see, church, if God is bringing different people, brothers and sisters, if you, if you've got to look at this, look at them as kind of like the Macedonian church. And I'm not saying we're the Corinthian church. I'm not. I'm not saying that at all. But God is moving and bringing others all around our states to help the powerless, the poor, the needy, the people that have been victimized by poverty. But we can only do this, we can only respond if we are motivated by Christ's love and generosity. They're going to be here at the end of the month. For seven days. And we're going to host them in our church. And they're going to work alongside us. Not do the work for us. Because our Bible study groups are doing amazing things. Amen? Amen. And we are mobilizing our church to go and love and action and truth. And we've been doing that. So I thank you guys for doing that. Point two. It says... A test of our sincerity, of our love, and appreciation for Christ. As I thought about verses 8 and 9, I truly believe that God 
is always testing us. And when God test, is testing us, it really means one thing, that He's wanting us to not only, wanting us to respond to His call. And here I believe, how we respond to our communities, to our cities, to those who are hurting, is a test of our sincerity and love and appreciation for Christ. And this is what 8 and 9 says, it says, I say this not as a command, and again, there's Paul again not trying to, to be so, trying to be a dictator here. He's trying, to, he's trying to really walk alongside the Corinthian church and, 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 and encourage them, you know, slowly and saying, you know, I'm, I'm motivating you positively. I'm not saying, my goodness, I do not get it, right? He didn't say that. He says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you may that you by his poverty might become rich. Paul wanted them to truly understand that they ought to prove their love, that they ought to be genuine. Genuine love is seen when we are selfless. Genuine love is seen when we are when we are unconditional about it. Because it's easy to love someone and say, I love you, but when, when it's hard to love them, you don't really love them anymore. But when you are able to love someone when it's not convenient for you, when you are able to love someone when it's gonna cost you something, not just money, but your actual time and energy. It actually takes away from your own, you know, your own hobbies and your own things that, you, that your own routines that you do that makes you happy. Yesterday, I encouraged the, the college guys and the youth to come, and they did. And you know what, church? It's hard work. I can't describe you the smell. And if you are going through that, I'm sorry, we are going to help you. We're going to pray for you, we're going to help you. But do you understand, when, when they volunteered, not once did those youth say, you know, Pastor, this stinks in here, I want to go home. I'm glad they did it. <laughs> I don't think I'll be that patient. Like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Sit in the car, no, I wouldn't. But no, they did not complain. And we went to house, to house, to house. And they were genuine about it. They were genuine about it. And here Paul uses the great example. He, again, he, he slowly walks with the Corinthian church and then he hits them with the main point. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you may, by his poverty, might become rich. Now, Paul's not talking about wealth here, okay? So don't think about it, it's about money here. No. Here, he's describing that God, who created the heavens and the earth, who's all-powerful, who knows all things, saw you when you were in need, saw you when you were powerless, and that you were separated from Him because of your sins, and that you were headed towards condemnation and death. And when He saw you, he humbled himself as a servant, took the form of man. And what did he say? I didn't come to be served, but to serve. He lowered himself. Can we lower ourselves? I mean, it's even, even hard for us to, 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 to do something that, that we don't want to do. See, when we look at Christ, when we look at the cross, and how Paul describes this, that he was rich and he became poor for you. And when he, when he became poor, you became rich. It ought to drive this love and appreciation in our lives. Amen? 
It ought to, to make us humble, make us unworthy of receiving this great love. Because if we look at our lives today, and I was mentioning this to one of the guys, I said, we are so blessed. Because most of our church members weren't affected. Do you guys see that? Do you, do you see the, the, the odds of that? That's a, there's some crazy odds. Because we all live in the greater Houston area. And my house is like maybe three feet away. And I just bought my home. And to be honest, I don't have flood insurance. I was like, they told me it's cheap if it's not a flood zone. And I didn't take it. I was like, Man, please. I don't remember like, but they were like, it's only a house. Evacuate. Who cares? That's what my grandparent, my, my mother in law said. But you see, we're so blessed. And as we look at our own lives, we are rich. Not in terms of money, but rich in Christ. But there's so many people in our communities who may have a lot of money, but are not rich. They're spiritually poor and depraved. In our community, so many of them are going through this. I said it last week. Imagine going home and, and all your stuff. And yesterday, there was a Philippine, Philippine family I helped, and we had to dump all their, their belongings. It was done. Photos. You can't save it. How would you feel if you had to go through that for months? And what if you don't have insurance? How are you going to pay for it? I can't imagine going through that right now. And so if we are blessed, and we are rich in Christ, how do we respond? Church, this is a test. I can't stress this enough. Paul encouraged the church of Corinth that this is a test of your sincerity. If you truly believe who God is, if you truly say He is Lord of all, and that you, you're willing to go all in, then are you willing to go all in when things are difficult, when things, when God calls you to be uncomfortable, when God calls you to get out of your comfort zone and talk to someone you've never talked to? As I close, I'll call the worship, the choir group to come up. The burden for all of us is this, that Just like the church of Corinth, we are being challenged by God Almighty to respond to people that are in need. Because if we look at our lives, man, we are really motivated for the things we love. Whether that's our career, that's our family, that's, that's our money, right? The things that we own, our hobbies. We're motivated to do that. We're motivated to, to go after, go home and watch the game. Or to, to, to go to our, our brunch or to spend time with our well, Those are good. But now God is motivating us to be motivated in helping those who are in need. Something that He did every single day. Something that He preached about every single time and hammered it and hammered it to his disciples. What did he say? Blessed are those who are, who are meek, right? Blessed are those who are poor and not who are, who are poor, right? Blessed are those who are, who are pure in heart. God desires us to be a church that not only loves him when things are okay, but to be his hands and feet when people all around us are powerless, are going through crap, are going through heartaches and headaches. There was a Hispanic lady that was at the Filipino house that we were helping, and she, and she said, can you guys help us? Because, you know, I asked this one church to help us, but they never came. And they said, yeah, well, yeah, we'll help you. And, and, and she began to tell me her story. She said, you know what, we, we, we were renting this house, and there was a, a family that was going to come in, but... 
thankfully, thank God that they didn't come because Harvey came and, and, and they, their stuff was spared. And I don't think she was a believer. You see, there's so many people around us that God has opened up for us to be salt and light. To be, just like our mission statement, to change lives and make disciples. Amen. I can't stress enough, that moment is here. And I'm not asking you to go that way, that way. Just go to your communities. Volunteer in your shelter. I guarantee you'll find someone who's looking for community, who's looking for someone to comfort them, who's looking for someone to just say, how are you today? Can I pray for you? The bottom line is this. And the kids will write the bottom line now, right kids? We should live for Christ out of gratitude and love. We should live for Christ out of gratitude and love and thus planting the seeds of generosity in our own lives and in our church. Grandparents, today's Grandparents Day. I understand you lived this earth for a while, but I believe God has a message for you today. God can still use you to live a generous life, to give to others who are in need, whether that's praying, whether that's motivating your kids and your grandchildren to go. God can still use you. Because I guarantee you have someone in your neighborhood whose kids are going through there, going through the mess. And at this moment, I truly believe that God's spirit is moving. His movement is moving in our in the great state of Texas. You ever think about why God allowed Harvey to sit? He literally just parked here and stayed for several days. Why is that? Because God has a plan and purpose. We may not understand it, we may not agree, but as followers of Christ, we see people around us open. We see people around us in need. And we know our mission. We know what we ought to do. So let's do it. Amen? If you have volunteered and prayed, raise your hand this week. And this is not to give you glory. I just want to show our church. And this will motivate us to go. Raise your hand. It won't be like this. Just raise your hand. Amen. If you have prayed, keep it up, please. If you have prayed for people, Raise your other hand if you're already two. Okay? Raise your other hand. If you want to volunteer this week, stand up. I'm standing because I want to volunteer again. Okay, not just because. You want to volunteer again this week because there's people in our projects, right? There's so many, so many in our FPC Harvey project that needs help. Stand up. Amen. And lastly, if you're going to volunteer this week, if you're going to pray, I, I urge you guys to find those opportunities to share your story. Because there's going to be a time when you're going to have to take a break. It's true. And it's when you take that break and you say, hey, you know, this guy, Brother Renee. Hey, Brother Renee, how are you? You know, how can I pray for you? I'll pray for this or that. Well, can I pray for you right now? Pray. And then say, hey, Brother Renee, I know you're having a hard time. I know this has been difficult, but... And I tell you a time in my life when it was difficult for me too. It might not be the same where you're going through this, but and then you share your story. You have no idea how God's going to work. But don't miss that opportunity. You can be the hands and feet, but you got to tell the truth when the Holy Spirit urges you to share it. Amen? Amen. All right. Amen. Let's sing our last song. Let's, let's stand and sing our last song.
help us to live out our faith out of love and gratitude for you. And to remember of your great example, your agape love for us. That while we were poor and deprived, you saw us and you made us rich in you. You made us spiritually rich and forgiven. And you became poor. You became a servant. And not only a servant, that you laid down your only life, your life who was blameless, who was perfect, who did no wrong. And you took the shame, took the crown, the thorns of crown, and bled for us so that we may know and experience salvation. God, help us be the hands and feet this week. Help us be a church that loves continually, unconditionally, and lives a generous life to those who are in need. Help us display a life of grace giving to our neighbors, not just this month, not just this year, but every day of our lives. We love you, we pray.